This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have uh, historian Dr. Edward Gray, who specializes in early American history. He received his A.B. in history from the University of Chicago in 1988, uh, Ph.D. in history from Brown University in 1996. And then in 1998, he joined the Florida State University's History Department, uh, where he was the chair between 19, or 2013 and 2022. Uh, Dr. Gray has written several books on his own, I think five, maybe even more, uh, as well as edited several books, contributed to book chapters, published journal articles, uh, encyclopedia chapters, uh, written reviews, delivered papers to conferences, uh, and many, many other great things that academics do. Um, in 2022, Dr. Gray was awarded an NEH sabbatical fellowship to research at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, where he worked on the topic of today's long table, uh, which is entitled Benjamin Franklin's Money, A Financial Life of the First American. So please, Dr. Gray, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jesse, and, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Emma. And thank you to your IT person, who I didn't get to talk to too much, but I'm sorry, I had a little bit of technical, a few technical challenges, um, but hopefully things will things will iron out here. Um, so, um, and thank to thank you all for taking time out of your day to 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 join the talk and to hear what I have to say about Franklin and money. Um, I'll spare you the the apologetics about my uh, understanding of the things that you all know so well, uh, which is very limited in my case. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is really, um, uh, from I think your perspective, um, money in a more abstract sense, although we are going to talk about uh, actual money as well. Uh, material, the material stuff that is money. Um, I don't see anybody talking. I don't see anybody's mouth moving. Sorry, there's a uh, slide uh, show, so that's what you'll see. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the subject of my talk or the subjects are things I think that are probably familiar to most of you all. Uh, one of them is uh, Benjamin Franklin, someone you've no doubt heard of. Um, and the other, of course, is money. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the relationship between these two things is 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 interesting. And that's uh, the subject of my my recent research and a, a book that I'm I'm working on right now. Um, and I want to try to introduce the subject in uh, a, a kind of uh, general uh, sense and show you some slides. Um, so the first time I gave this talk, it was uh, at uh, um, Franklin Hall, uh, which is the building on the left. Um, and uh, I think it's instructive to think a little bit about the location of that building and some other buildings uh, in the neighborhood. So this is Center City, Philadelphia, right on uh, Chestnut Street down near uh, Independence Mall, which some of you may be uh, familiar with. Um, and this, uh, the building that, that's on the left here, this uh, which is now known as Franklin Hall, was actually uh, originally built in 1854, um, and it was the headquarters of the Farmers and Mechanics Bank. And if you walk out of Franklin Hall uh, and you turn left on Chestnut Street, right next door is another building, a former bank building, now a very posh uh, condo building, but it was originally built in 1857 as the Philadelphia National Bank. Um, and across the street on Chestnut Street from these two buildings is the very monumental uh, uh, neo uh, Roman structure that you see uh, here in the in the third slide, um, and that is the uh, the building that was built to house the Second Bank of the United States, which opened um, uh, in uh, in 1816. Um, it's the bank that's famous because it's the one that uh, Andrew Jackson went after uh, during his presidential campaign. And then, if you keep walking down Chestnut Street. 
oops, sorry. And you cross uh, 4th Street, um, you'll see a little alleyway. And if you look down that alleyway, you see this structure, this kind of interesting assemblage here uh, in, in the first slide. And that's, of course, uh, the, the um, uh, Park Service's Benjamin Franklin House Museum and, uh, and related uh, structures and buildings. So the white metal frame is, is meant to replicate the original uh, frame of Franklin's, the Franklin family home, which was in this courtyard. And then uh, behind it, it which uh, abuts uh, Market Street, uh, are Franklin's businesses, the printing shop and the stationery shop that the Franklin's, uh, and I say plural because it's really Franklin and other members of his family. It was a family enterprise. Uh, Deborah, his wife, the most important uh, business partner for him. And if you if you walk out of this courtyard and return to Chestnut Street and then you turn right uh, on Third Street and you walk down, you see another monumental uh, neo gresham uh, building on the right hand side of the street. This is the first uh, bank of the United States, which was opened in uh, 1796. And then across the street um, uh, from that bank. Uh, uh, the third slide here, this is a building known as the uh, Merchants Exchange Building. This is a Jacksonian era, another Greek uh, revival, obviously a period of the federal period, very interested in neoclassical architecture. Um, uh, this was a, a commodities exchange, essentially, uh, built uh, um, you know, for merchants to do their business with each other. And if you cross uh, Walnut Street on the other side of this, uh, the the Merchants Exchange building, um, you'll see a small clearing, and next to that clearing is a is a building, and and on that building is a plaque, and the plaque says that this was the location of the former residence of the uh, uh, first Treasury Secretary of the United States, and that's of course Alexander Hamilton. Um, so I think you you get my general point here, which is that if you go anywhere in Benjamin Franklin's neighborhood in the Philadelphia that he inhabited, and I, I recognize that these structures I've all talked about were built after uh, Franklin was gone, um, but I think the point still holds, um, it's very difficult to, to experience that neighborhood without encountering evidence of both Franklin and uh, financial activity, activities involving money. Um, and I don't think the proximity of the two was uh, at all accidental. Um, uh, Franklin, as it turns out, was uh, more involved with money, uh, real actual paper money, paper, uh, real actual money, paper bills, coins, money issued by governments, money created by semi-private banks, uh, money issued by uh, uh, commercial uh, mercantile uh, firms, banking firms. Um, he was more involved with, with this kind of thing, with money of this sort, than any of his prominent founding era peers. That is, Franklin's uh, associated with the founding of the United States, um, as Hamilton and so many others, but I don't think any of the other sort of members of the typical pantheon of the American founding uh, uh, was as closely involved uh, with the world of money uh, as was Franklin. And I think uh, Franklin's involvement with money, um, particularly early in his career as business person and printer, um, prepared the way for a, a financial revolution, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, um, and that financial revolution uh, made possible both the United States in a certain sense, um, but also the, the culture of finance that is so evident in Franklin's old neighborhood in Philadelphia. So let me try to illustrate what I'm saying about Franklin and money and Franklin's uh, sort of relationship to money um, by setting up a contrast with another character who I've mentioned, and that's, of course, Alexander Hamilton. Um, and I think Hamilton is the figure from this era most commonly associated with money and finance. Um, and he was, without question, uh, arguably the supreme 
uh, public financier of Amer in American history, certainly the uh, one of the great fiscal minds uh, in American history. But what I want to try to suggest here is that uh, uh, Hamilton and Franklin had a very different relationship with money. Um, so let me let me try to make that point. Um, so I think one of the interesting things about Hamilton is that although he was, by all accounts, uh, a financial genius, um, he wasn't really that interested in making money. Um, and what you have here is a, this is a quote uh, from Hamilton from a letter that he sends uh, to his friend, John Lawrence. He says, in perfect confidence, I whisper in your ear, I hate money-making men. Now, it seems like a strange statement for the American public figure uh, so commonly associated with, with finance and money uh, to, to, for, for, to come from such a person. But actually, it's not particularly strange at all. Um, and what, what I'll try to show you is that actually when it comes to money and thinking about money and money making people, Franklin is really the outlier. Um, so the specific context of this comment, of this uh, remark that, that Hamilton makes, uh, is wartime profiteering. So he's very upset that uh, um, uh, people like Silas Dean, the diplomat and merchant who were uh, in, given confidence by the Continental Congress, exploit that confidence to their own personal and enormous uh, financial gain during the course of the Revolutionary War. Um, um, and there are others, uh, Robert Morris and so on, that frustrate public figures like Hamilton, and that's what Hamilton's talking about here. But I think, in a sense, the comment applies more generally um, and is more generally reflective of a kind of culture of money and finance that Hamilton inhabits or of, of the way that he, uh, uh, that the world that he inhabits uh, uh, understands money and finance and, and far transcends uh, the particular remark and, and Hamilton himself. And so we might begin to think about this by considering the 18th century obsession with rent-taking forms of wealth or forms of wealth that sustained a passive income. And my favorite illustration of this um, is uh, 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 this, this uh, primacy of illiquid landed forms of wealth uh, over financial wealth can be seen in uh, some of the great country homes and estates of, of Britain uh, in the 18th century. Um, most of the great homes that you would see today are 18th century homes. Uh, there are obviously older aristocratic homes, and a number of them, but, but uh, the countryside is, is uh, insofar as it is loaded up with these uh, Georgian era mansions and great estates. Um, um, they're mostly a product of the 18th century. Um, and many, if not most of them, are, are not uh, entirely or even primarily the product of ancient aristocratic landed wealth, but actually have some uh, significant uh, indebtedness to more uh, um, liquid forms or commercial forms of wealth um, that, that a lot of these homes were built by nouveau riche families or uh, and, and most of those families either directly or indirectly profited from um, the uh, uh, imperial activities of Britain in the 18th century, particularly the sugar trade. And so I've just shown these are th uh, four uh, um, uh, English houses. All of them um, were primarily financed by or built directly by people who made their fortunes in the West Indian uh, sugar trade and and the related uh, trade in enslaved uh, people. Uh, and uh, I won't go into all the details of all the houses, but the one here in the middle uh, on the, uh, this is Fontel Spendens was actually uh, destroyed in the early 19th century. But I will read you a, a brief quote. This is from uh, 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 the eventual prime minister, Lord Shelburne. And he's, he's talking about the English countryside in 1778. And he says, it's, there's scarcely 10 miles throughout the country where the house and estate of a rich West Indian was not to be seen. And there's a similar phenomenon on the American side of the Atlantic, uh, um, uh, particularly in Virginia, which is the main mainland of the mainland colonies, the wealthiest uh, of them. 
Virginia's relation to landed wealth makes it, in a sense, uh, the exceptional colonial, uh, 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 the exceptional uh, mainland colony that proves a larger British American rule when it comes to uh, thinking about money and attitudes towards money. So it's difficult to know the precise numbers here, but Virginia plantations were very often, and if not predominantly, financially underwater. And they were underwater, that is, they were, um, you know, the, the, the amount of leverage, the amount of debt that, that they carried exceeded the possibility of, of, of the returns uh, covering the cost of that debt. Um, um, and for the most part, this debt was a function uh, not so much of uh, uh, activity that was intended to extend the business uh, prospects of these enterprises, and they were enterprise enterprises, but because they were largely uh, they were leveraged extensively to pay for uh, for fine things for for the appurtenances of a landed genteel lifestyle, fine apparel, wines, horses, art, and and so on. Um, because of the relative or relative to land values in England, land values were much lower in Tidewater, Virginia, and because the fortunes of Virginia's wealthiest tobacco planters were uh, paltry compared to those of the richest sugar barons, the process of securing social status associated with landed wealth was fundamentally a process of ornamentation, of acquiring the fineries of the genteel rich uh, without ever possessing the underlying estate. In this sense, the gentry of Virginia look a lot more like modern consumers than their much wealthier West Indian counterparts. Unable to access generational landed wealth and the passive rent-taking lifestyle that it enabled, they were left to chase status through consumption, but that consumption required precisely the sorts of exercises or adventures uh, in finance long disdained by the true landed gentry. Most fundamentally, it, it involved massive borrowing. So my point here is that having money and doing things with money, the world of finance, this is generally regarded in the 18th century, at least by social elites, as the stuff of the counting house, but absolutely not the stuff of the manor house. Any reasonable 18th century millionaire or billionaire, and there weren't really any millionaires or billionaires, but uh, if we think about it in terms of the, the most uh, wealthy uh, in the era, um, the primary ambition, and we can see this actually in the person of the, the greatest, uh, the wealthiest uh, uh, figure in the English speaking world anyway, the, the monarch, um, all of their primary ambition, the primary thrust of their, uh, uh, their, their spending um, was to achieve landed wealth and, and to achieve at least the, the perception of a, a, a lifestyle that rested on passive uh, rent-taking sorts of, uh, of wealth. So let me return now to Hamilton um, and try to talk a little bit about Hamilton in the context of this larger uh, culture of, of earning and, and wealth in the 18th century. So Hamilton was a lawyer and a public official and, and certainly engaged in, in some business activities and did so very profitably. Um, he was involved, for example, in the founding of the Bank of New York. He was involved in the founding later of the First Bank of the United States, as we mentioned, the building located on Third Street. Um, and these, these banks the Bank of the United States, the first uh, Bank of New York, the Bank of North America, which is the first bank chartered by Congress, by the federal government. These were public private enterprises. So all of them had uh, private shareholders uh, and Hamilton invested in, in things of this kind. Um, but none of this accounts for the, the, the primary um, uh, foundation of Hamilton's wealth. That, uh, that came, uh, in a much more conventional uh, 18th century way um, through his marriage in 1780 to Elizabeth Schuyler, the daughter of Philip Schuyler and Van, uh, Catherine Van Rensselaer, uh, uh, children of two of New York's, if I believe New York's wealthiest um, uh, uh, families and, and between them owners of uh, one of the largest landed estates in British North America. Um, and this is a, a map that shows, so this is the, 
uh, on the left is the uh, the uh, Van Rensselaer Manor. This so this is the private lands that the Van Rensselaers controlled, which they could then uh, in fief, which means that they could grant manors within the manor to others. Um, um, the Schuylers were one family that had a manor within the larger Van Rensselaer Manor. So this is um, the Schuyler family mansion, which is actually located in the Rensselaer family uh, um, uh, properties. Um, but the point here is that in marrying into this family, um, Hamilton became an extraordinarily wealthy person um, and came to inhabit this world of manor houses uh, as opposed to the world of, of counting houses and banks. Okay, so now let me turn to Franklin. So Franklin uh, was also, as you know, extraordinarily wealthy. It's difficult to say exactly how wealthy he was, but um, uh, he was certainly among the wealthiest uh, people in colonial America. Um, and much like Hamilton, Franklin possessed extensive illiquid wealth as well. Um, at the time of his death, Franklin's landed estate was vast. He owned hundreds of acres uh, uh, total. He owned acreage in Chester County, Pennsylvania. He owned acreage in Georgia. He owned acreage in, in Ohio. Um, and he owned a massive uh, estate in Nova Scotia. He also owned rental properties in Boston and, and Philadelphia. But Franklin was also very heavily invested in uh, uh, more liquid forms of wealth. Um, uh, so it's very difficult to get this sorted out, and I wish I had the forensic accounting chops to, to be able to do this. Um, um, but at the time of his death in 1790, Franklin owned an extensive investment portfolio, mostly in the form of bonds, um, but he also owned shares in some enterprises. The most significant of these is the first publicly chartered bank in the United States, the Bank of North America, which was the one I mentioned a second ago, chartered by Congress uh, in 1781. And it's clear that his investment portfolio totaled probably in the neighborhood of a million dollars in, in present day money. Um, and this uh, document that I'm showing you here on the left, this is a page from the inventory that was uh, created by the executor of Hen uh, Franklin's estate, Henry Hill, who was a Quaker um, uh, um, wine merchant and, and very close uh, friend of Franklin's and who had the incredibly complicated and difficult challenge of, of assessing and, and, and assembling uh, Franklin's assets after Franklin passed in 1790. Um, so, uh, this uh, this is the the liquid portion of Franklin's estate, but actually, uh, it it really I think only constitutes a small percentage. It's impossible to know the precise percentage because uh, most of Franklin's other liquid assets uh, existed um, uh, uh, as active what we might call active business investments. And so let me explain what I mean by that. So Franklin retired from the printing trade in 1748 at age 42, um, but he maintained his investment interest in the business, the printing business that his uh, friend David Hall uh, or his co-business uh, uh, partner Hall uh, operated. He maintained that interest for 18 years. Um, um, and this generated substantial income for Franklin, about 14,000 uh, British uh, pounds during that 18 year period. And this is a, a very substantial amount. So just to give you a sense of this, um, over the same period, uh, an average average household income in the mid Atlantic would have been about 1100 pounds. So this is more than 10 times the, uh, the just from this one investment asset alone uh, of what a normal household in total would have made in that period. And Franklin uh, invested those funds and he invested other funds that he made. So Franklin had an appointment as deputy postmaster general uh, for the American mainland colonies. Um, and in that capacity, he earned, uh, uh, he earned effectively a salary. He had a, uh, it really, well, he was given the, the, he was entitled in that capacity to do lots of things that he charged people for. Um, um, and so, you know, it, it was almost like a concession. 
Um, and through that concession, he, he, profited, he profited immensely. This is the money uh, that it appears he used to acquire land in Nova Scotia, where he had about uh, an estate of uh, over 30,000 acres. Um, so, but there's yet more here, obviously. Um, um, these are all kind of familiar forms of, uh, of investment businesses, uh, you know, uh, um, bonds outstanding that, that represent concrete uh, um, loans. Um, but Franklin, uh, I think, was perhaps more heavily invested in something that is a little bit less familiar. Um, and that is uh, uh, the, the bulk of Franklin's wealth was a function of what we might call person-to-person uh, -person or private banking activities. Um, so in all of his capacities as a business person, as a public figure, uh, Franklin extended credit to dozens of friends, business associates, and family members. Um, and again, it's very difficult to account for all of this. Um, um, and few of these this, these uh, uh, transactions involved actual money. Um, they were mostly done using book uh, uh, credits and, and debits and, 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 and that sort of thing. And then uh, uh, bills of exchange, which are effectively uh, checks uh, written on accounts that Franklin controlled that then circulated. Um, and Hill uh, spent uh, a number of years uh, trying to track down all of the uh, interpersonal debts um, that were uh, that were owed uh, Franklin's estate um, um, in order to to take an account of these for for Frank for the beneficiaries of that estate, um, it, it's hard to say whether he was actually able to you know what percentage of all of this uh, banking activity Hill was able to account for, um, but this is would be very typical. Of, of an, an active uh, commercial figure in the 18th century to, to acquire, um, you know, a, a, to, for their portfolio to be uh, significantly uh, characterized by these kinds of interpersonal uh, debts. So to summarize here, uh, Franklin and Hamilton were both extraordinarily wealthy men, um, but one of them achieved wealth in the conventional 18th century way, primarily, uh, and that was through passive rent-taking property ownership. This is how Hamilton really rose to become as extraordinarily wealthy as he was. Um, and in Franklin's case, although he did own property and land, um, I think it's fair to say that he didn't achieve his, uh, the scope of his, uh, his estate was not, uh, uh, or the, the, the bulk of his estate um, was not uh, that that type of investment. It was in other more conventional, liquid uh, financial kinds of assets. So I think some of this would be familiar to uh, those of you in the audience who who know things about Franklin. For example, who've read uh, Franklin's autobiography, um, you know from that very famous and justly celebrated um, book uh, that Franklin understood himself and depicted himself um, as, as a self-made person, as somebody who seized on opportunity, uh, often made possible through patronage, uh, to enrich himself. And that like other uh, rich men of the period, Franklin um, used some of his wealth to acquire land and, and, to, and to become a, a rent taker. But this was never, and Franklin doesn't depict it this way, the original or primary source of his wealth. Franklin got rich as he never tired of telling readers of the autobiography and, and other writings of his, uh, his famous uh, uh, set of aphorisms in the way to wealth. Uh, he got rich through business acumen and careful management of his money. Um, of course, the, the story is, is, uh, is fairly complicated and I've only given a very a general gloss on it here, but the basic point I think is, is accurate that Franklin's wealth is really a function of doing things with money. Um, and, 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 but I think in some ways, what is more striking about Franklin um, is that uh, Franklin makes no apology for this. Franklin is very forward and, 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 and uh, forthright about the basis for his wealth. 
Um, he doesn't try to, to you know, uh, uh, burnish his, his, uh, his, his, his money or to try to clean it of its uh, ordinary kind of counting house taint. He understands it to be what it is. Um, and he doesn't, uh, uh, you know, try to pretend to be a person of, uh, uh, of aristocratic or genteel uh, qualities um, uh, such that, you know, he wouldn't have been uh, involved in money or using, actively using money and managing money. Um, um, but I said at the beginning that Franklin was more involved with money than, than other founders. So this is uh, to this point, we've talked about wealth and about the origins of, of Franklin's wealth and, and, and in comparison to that of, of Hamilton. Um, but I think this only be, doesn't, or I should say, barely scratches the surface of, of Franklin's connection to money. Um, and, and here is where the real uh, distinction comes between someone like Franklin and Hamilton. Um, um, and so let me try to, to, to elaborate here. So a year before Franklin and his wife, Deborah, joined in common law matrimony uh, in 1730, Franklin published his first significant political tract. And it was entitled, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. Uh, the pamphlet urged the Pennsylvania Assembly to authorize a new paper money issue. And I'll return to this uh, shortly, but for the moment, let me say that the campaign proved uh, successful, or at least uh, Franklin's contribution to it was consistent with what ended up actually happening. Um, and what ended up actually happening was that the Pennsylvania Assembly did decide to print more paper money. Um, and significantly, uh, it turned to the chief printer of Pennsylvania government documents uh, who was becoming at the time, this was, he was entering this business, uh, Franklin. Um, Franklin was awarded the contract to print 40,000 uh, pounds Pennsylvania currency, paper notes. And this earned his business um, about 100 pounds uh, uh, of Pennsylvania currency or roughly $10,000 um, in present day money. And Franklin's printing press, as you know, would print money for other colonies as well. They printed money for, or he and uh, his partner printed money for New Jersey and Delaware. And here are a few examples of these bills, which I'm sure um, you've seen countless times. And they in, in include some of the familiar uh, aphorisms and the injunctions against counterfeiting and Franklin's uh, famous uh, 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 prints of, of leaves that are used to, to try to forestall counterfeiting and so on. Um, and Franklin didn't just make money by making money, by printing money. He also made money from, from the paper that the money was printed on. Franklin was the largest wholesaler of paper in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and Franklin had investments in paper mills. And it, it looks like he had investment in one that was in Philadelphia and controlled by the uh, Rittenhouse family. Um, so he made money based on that investment, but he also made money because the paper that he used to print the money, um, he would, was able to acquire uh, through his relation with the, uh, uh, with the, um, um, uh, with the, with the paper mill and, and so on. Um, um, so it turns out also that Franklin's involvement with actually making money uh, rather than earning money uh, continued after he left uh, the printing business. So he retired um, um, and uh, uh, in, in 1748, I guess it was, um, but he continued to be involved in, in the printing trade. Um, and when the revolution started, uh, not long after, um, uh, uh, or while Franklin was in uh, England in the in the uh, uh, early 1770s, um, uh, Franklin returned to uh, to um, uh, to Philadelphia. Um, not too long after his primary business partner Deborah uh, died in, in 1774, um, and uh, um, 
his business, uh, the, the printing press hadn't actually printed money at that point uh, for a number of years, um, mostly because the, uh, the uh, British Parliament had prohibited the colonies uh, from uh, printing money following the passage uh, in 1764 of the, um, uh, uh, of the uh, Parliamentary Currency Act. Um, and of course, this prohibition, according, along with the new stamp tax, which was to be paid in hard money, hard currency, incited the, the, the crisis in relations between the colonies and the mother country that would ultimately yield revolution. And of course, Franklin would be at the center of that revolution from beginning to end. Um, when war erupted at Lexington Green in 1775, Franklin was at sea sailing back from England, where he had been serving as uh, 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 an American envoy to the court of uh, King George III and to Parliament. Um, and he, he returned to Philadelphia. And on his return, Franklin was immediately enlisted by the new Continental Congress um, in a variety of capacities. And most people recognize the, the, those capacities, the most important of which was that Franklin was involved in, or at least the most commonly uh, recognized was Franklin's role in uh, drafting a Declaration of Independence. Um, but I actually, I'm not sure that was the most important at the time. Um, and I'm not sure Franklin or his colleagues would have regarded his role in that what's called the Committee of Five as the most important role that he had in these early days of revolution. Franklin was also appointed to the committee charged with um, designing and, and executing a new national continental currency. Um, and I think uh, a very good argument could be made that this was, at least from the perspective of, of events in, in 1776, when this was all occurring in 1777, that this was the, was the more consequential appointment uh, for Franklin. So Franklin's experience as a printer and engraver, his literary skills, all of this made him the ideal uh, figure to be involved in creating an, a new uh, continental money. I'm sorry, this is... Um, and these are some uh, continental bills that, that reflect uh, Franklin's um, uh, influence, the uh, Sirecte Facius, uh, um, you know, injunctions, these kinds of Latinate injunctions, encouraging people to act correctly and to treat these bills with suitable uh, gravity. Um, uh, Congress obviously issued loads and loads of these. Um, um, between 1775 and 1779, um, it, it emission, it, it's, the emissions were, were, were fast and furious, and sometimes as often as every two weeks. Um, um, and by 1779, Congress had issued uh, 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 a couple of hundred million dollars in face value worth of, of continental currency. Of course, uh, you know, the, the actual value was not nothing like that. Um, and Franklin recognized that this was a hazard and went to, uh, you know, exerted himself to try to deal with this hazard. Um, part of his way of doing this was a familiar way using things that he uh, had employed when he was a printer and making money for colonies, uh, things to deter counterfeiters, uh, special, um, uh, uh, hard to replicate uh, engravings, eccentric spellings corresponding to different denominations, you know, various injunctions and, and moral uh, 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 phrases. Um, and of course, these measures, um, whatever Franklin may have hoped for, didn't do much to forestall the inevitable. The, the value of, of, uh, 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 of Congress's bills uh, plummeted. But again, you can see my larger point here, and that is that no American of the era uh, was more involved with the making of, of money, and in this case, the making of government money, than, than Benjamin Franklin. Um, Okay, so now let me turn to the to the next part of my talk. And again, um, I'm continuing with the basic thrust here, which is to try to uh, illustrate just how uh, central, you know, the, the practices associated with money, thinking about money, 
um, are to the to the career and the and the life course of, of Benjamin Franklin. So, in addition to these kind of concrete things that I've I've uh, uh, listed to to this point, Franklin wrote and thought a great deal about money, um, and I think he did this uh, with more. Uh, um, uh, subtlety and and one might even say profundity than even the great fiscal mind Hamilton. Um, so um, some of Franklin's ruminations about money, some of what Franklin said about money, um, are are familiar to us mostly because they uh, appear in in his uh, well known and widely read writings, including this. Uh, this is the way to wealth, which is the most uh, the best selling book that he wrote in his lifetime. Um, it was originally the preface to the final 1758 Poor Richard's Almanac, and then Franklin pulled it out and published it as a separate book. And it consists of ec uh, decades of of aphoristic wisdom from from Poor Richard's that Franklin uh, uh, collated and assembled here. Um, but I think what makes the book important is less what it says than what it doesn't say. There's nothing here about ancestral or marital wealth. Um, all of the advice and, 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 uh, and comments that Franklin includes that pertain to wealth, to well-being, to money, um, um, all of them assume a, a kind of connection between money and labor, money and work. There's no sense that rent taking and passive modes of income um, um, are, are pertinent to the morality that, that Franklin is trying to convey here. And Franklin's earlier writings are even more specific or more uh, 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 explicit in this vein. So this is a, um, a, a, a um, title page uh, from a book that Franklin uh, reproduced. So it was a British, uh, an English book, Advice to Young Tradesmen, um, that Franklin reproduced in, in, uh, in the colonies. Um, and he inserted in that, uh, um, or, I'm sorry, it's, it's the American instructor, it's what Franklin called it. Um, and he inserted into this larger document, which was a kind of uh, tradesman's handbook that was originally produced in England that Franklin then reprinted, but he inserted his own uh, uh, element into this, which he called prudent advice to young tradesmen. Um, and it's filled with, you know, the familiar kind of Franklin uh, aphorisms about money, time is money, credit is money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 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 Franklin, it doesn't appear ever said a penny saved is a penny earned, by the way. Uh, that seems to be misattributed, but you can see where, given the kind of wisdom that he's imparting here, that, that might uh, be a, 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 an apt distillation. Um, and then, of course, Franklin's best known publication. This is the first edition of Franklin's biography, which was initially published in French. There's a, 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 the first part of the biography was published as a French uh, edition. Um, but as you might know, have, if you've read it, that barely a page passes in the first part of the book where Franklin doesn't talk at least a little bit about money, about money that he has in his pockets, about using that money to do things like buy books and so on. Um, so again, uh, you can see the larger point here. Money uh, is something Franklin talks about all the time. He talks about explicitly. He does so with no shame uh, or diffidence. Money is, for Franklin, a fact of life, um, and, and there is nothing in this kind of persona uh, uh, of the, the aristocratic disdain for, uh, for money or the attempt to, to transmute uh, liquid money into, into illiquid forms of wealth. And so, of course, these are the popular and perhaps familiar parts of Franklin's intellectual interface with money, but there's a somewhat less familiar part. Um, Franklin actually thinks about money um, in a more, what we might call ontological sense, in that he thinks about money, uh, he, he, he's interested and 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 writes about what actually money is, which, as you know, is an enormously compelling and complicated and fascinating 
uh, question. And, and so, um, and I'll just try to give you some sense of this uh, by talking about two episodes in Franklin's life. So the first of these centers on the a publication which I showed you uh, earlier in the talk, this uh, Franklin's first ever uh, extensive political publication, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, which uh, Franklin published in 1729. So as I said, the pamphlet's aim was, was fairly simple, uh, to encourage the uh, Pennsylvania legislature to uh, continue to issue uh, paper notes as a circulating um, uh, 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 form of money in the, in the colony. Um, as a political act, there wasn't much simple or unassuming in the young printer's decision to intervene in what was the day's thorniest, by far, political controversy. For those who actually read the pamphlet, there wasn't much unassuming or simple in its content either. Paper money, as opposed to coinage or species, a uh, species, I'm sorry, uh, um, or paper money that is convertible into those things, Franklin argued, uh, was valuable because it was useful. So the thing that, that he does in this pamphlet is he doesn't just say you need to print more money. He says why this is actually good money to print, why it isn't crummy money, why paper money is actually legitimate money. And he says it, it's legitimate because it's useful, because it facilitates trade by doing what all other forms of money do. It serves as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a repository of value. And for those who claim that only real hard specie, gold and silver coinage, could safely fulfill these monetary functions, Franklin offered a radical response. Money of any kind, paper or specie, he believed, had could not be valued in any kind of fixed way or according to any sort of abstract uh, commodity value. It was valuable precisely in its utility. Um, obviously, Franklin recognized within this very uh, kind of particular uh, uh, explanation for money's value, there could be variation, that it, that, that value could vary. Um, um, but none of that took away from the fundamental fact that the reason money was uh, had value was not because of its intrinsic uh, scarce content or the materials of uh, that it was uh, made from, but but because of its utility. And so to believe otherwise, in Franklin's view, was to hearken back to a bullionist monetary world governed by, again, this kind of mystical sense, this, uh, this sort of alchemical sense of, of some sort of, uh, in Franklin's view, completely erroneous uh, uh, interdependence of, of, of money, uh, precious metals, and value. And so this idea of Franklin's that money's value has nothing whatsoever to do with its purported uh, intrinsic value is indicative, I think, of Franklin's willingness to depart from money's predominant ontology. Far from a mere commodity whose value is dictated by the market demand for the stuff out of which it is made or which in its paper form it promises, money is fundamentally a social technology invented by users to address social problems. Whether gold coins or paper bills, it is, in Franklin's thinking here, uh, the kin of other social technologies, the most important being uh, language. Both, of, both money and language are made by humans to serve the fundamental human propensity. In the words of Franklin's contemporary, the Scottish political economist, Adam Smith, to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. And Franklin holds to this utilitarian philosophy of money. Um, and I want to emphasize, when I say utilitarian, it doesn't mean that it lacks subtlety or, or, or theoretical complexity. The position actually is quite bold and, and theoretically uh, informed. Um, during Franklin's lifetime, this, this view um, uh, and this idea that, uh, that, that money can be separated from, from commodity value, um, um, it, it moves from the sort of periphery of monetary thinking, I would argue, to its center during the era of the American Revolution. 
And so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so in times of war, uh, Britain's American colonies, including the colony where Pennsylvania, uh, where Franklin lived, Pennsylvania, routinely re resorted to a paper fiat money, redeemable as tax payment. This is not wholly unlike what the federal government does in our own day. And during the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress and the states did a version of the same, although the terms of the various paper bills revolutionary governments issued uh, varied uh, quite widely. Um, um, and one of the results of the cacophonous monetary environment of the revolutionary era. So basically, um, uh, for interesting reasons, the chief kind of financing public mechanism for public finance in the revolutionary period was uh, to issue paper notes, um, basically non-interest bearing uh, bonds. Um, um, but there's no centralized clearinghouse for these notes. So there's no treasury, there's no uh, uh, constitutional supremacy um, that grants the federal government total monopoly over the creation and issue of uh, legal tender uh, and so on. Um, and one of the problems with this, or at least one of the one of the the collateral uh, um, developments associated with this uh, was the devaluation of um, of currencies issued in the in the uh, in the in periods of crisis when uh, colonies uh, themselves start issuing uh, their own money and these all circulate and they begin to face complicated issues of exchange as they go from one colony to the next and across the ocean to, to Europe and so on. Um, and Franklin recognized this problem. Um, he also recognized the related problem of inflation with so many different sources of paper circulating, the value of that paper inevitably um, uh, uh, diminished. Um, and he recognized that this was gonna be a problem during the American Revolution um, and as he was working on uh, the Continental Bills before he left to go to France, um, uh, he, he was fully aware that, that financing war through this kind of uh, um, um, uh, issuing of this, these types of paper bills was, 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 was dangerous. Um, but Franklin thought that the, the benefits of doing this would ultimately offset the costs. Um, and we can get some sense of the way Franklin thought about this uh, from an unpublished essay um, entitled Of the Paper Money of America, which he, it appears that he wrote it in 1784. Um, this is probably, this, so the war has ended by this point, um, but the war ends and, there, and the country faces perhaps the worst depression in American history, a terrible, terrible economic uh, crisis following the end uh, of the war. Um, 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 so Franklin uh, knew that that the, the, the and, and one of the debates going on during this post-war financial crisis and fiscal crisis um, was what to do with all this paper money. Um, and the 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 prevailing view was that the paper money should be redeemed. Uh, it should be um, called in, it should be eliminated from circulation, um, and that new money should be issued, and the new money should be uh, hard money, or at least convertible to hard money. It should be backed by um, reserves, hard money reserves, so that the holders of those notes knew that they could redeem them for uh, actual coinage, should they choose to do so. And the idea was that this would rescue American money, rescue continental money, rescue the, uh, the, the credit rating of the United States and, and so on. But the problem with this for Franklin um, and others as well, actually Franklin wasn't the only person who thought this, uh, was that this model of American finance meant that the United States, having just fought a war to achieve its independence from Great Britain, from the entanglements that Britain and its empire uh, um, 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 were constantly facing and were imposing on their uh, colonial subjects that that to to 
convert existing uh, currency to hard money backed currency uh, would Franklin recognize entangle uh, the United States once again in uh, the politics of Europe and particularly the fiscal politics of the great powers of Europe, which were driven uh, in large measure by a quest to control as much of the reserve uh, specie that, that, they, that it could possibly control. And Franklin thought that there was a way to deal with this, that there was a way to deal with the, the, uh, the problem of inflation and the, and the resulting financial dislocation, uh, while at the same time uh, allowing the United States to remain liberated from the uh, fiscal politics of the old world. And uh, Franklin's solution to this problem, as he articulates it in um, this uh, short uh, uh, essay that I mentioned of paper money, was to rethink inflation and to understand inflation not um, as a financial uh, or source of financial hardship, but as, as a tax, um, and, and more particularly as a tax on wealth. So such a tax, uh, as Franklin understood it, would obviously be controversial. It would have been controversial in Franklin's day and certainly uh, controversial in our own day. Um, um, but in a certain sense, the idea of taxing wealth was less controversial in Franklin's day, uh, independent of the idea of thinking about inflation as a tax. So most taxes in the 18th century uh, whether they're stamp taxes, targeted excise taxes, uh, duties on imports, property taxes, even more eccentric taxes, which did exist, such as taxes on bachelors who were taxed for failing to, to, to produce families and, and thereby contribute uh, uh, useful labor to the economy. Um, all of these taxes are understood to be progressive insofar as they fell on those most able to pay uh, taxes, those with the most disposable liquid uh, income, um, or those not suited to be custodians of scarce money. Um, so, you know, uh, if, if you, if you uh, 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 have money, but you're buying things, but uh, if, if you're being careless in the way that you're buying money, you're using your money and, and, and consuming, um, then, you know, you shouldn't possess scarce money, it should be taxed. So there's a kind of moral economy to ideas of taxation in the 18th century that, that plays into this thinking about, about taxes and, and who, who should bear the burden of taxes. So wage earners, and this is something Franklin is fully aware of and talks about in his, in his essay, um, they don't fit either of these categories. That is, they're neither uh, uh, those most, uh, able to pay taxes in the sense that they have surplus wealth, but nor are they, they those uh, least suited to be custodians of wealth in the sense that they're uh, careless and, and, uh, and, uh, and reckless in their spending habits. Um, and the problem isn't, or the, the, the situation with, with wage uh, 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 laborers or with, with, uh, with laboring people is not that they're immune to reckless uh, spending or reckless financial behavior, but, but the, the thing that sets them apart was the fact that they were very much unlikely to possess actual money at any point, or, and if they did possess it, they'd un they were unlikely to possess it for any duration. So wage earners might receive actual money, and Franklin talks about himself uh, receiving money in his early days as an apprentice in his father's uh, candle making shop in Boston and then subsequently in his various uh, activities. But the sums were minuscule. It was usually token money, meaning money that was fractional and not in, uh, intrinsically valuable. Um, and insofar as inflation was likely to affect uh, wage earners, uh, because they were not likely to, to hold money for any length of time, um, uh, it would probably uh, affect them positively, uh, Franklin thought, because most likely since wage earners uh, were unlikely to, to, to be able to hold money, um, um, they, were, they were most likely going to have to acquire things uh, through loans, that is they would hold debt. 
Um, and if they held debt, then uh, inflation would actually be helpful to them because it would lower the cost of, of financing their debt. So, uh, so this is uh, Franklin's argument that, that if you think about inflation as a tax, then it helps debtors um, and it places the burden of financing this, uh, the government and paying for public services on those who control the money supply, namely creditors. Now, this is a, a kind of a redistributionist, uh, at least to our modern ears, way of thinking about uh, taxation and about money, but I don't think that's uh, the way Franklin thought about it. I think Franklin understood that taxes and power were of a piece, so there was little sense in the, in the period, in the 18th century, uh, that taxation would lo uh, alter the locus of financial power. He, he wouldn't have thought that that uh, uh, um, extending the tax burden on those who controlled money um, would, would fundamentally alter the, the, the distribution of wealth, um, 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 particularly given the, the degree to which that distribution was unequal in Franklin's uh, day. But I don't think these were Franklin's motives in talking about inflation tax. I think what Franklin was really interested in, that is, I don't think Franklin was seeking to, to revolutionize uh, uh, or to, to be revolutionary in a social sense by redistributing wealth. I think Franklin was seeking to be revolutionary in a, in a, in a monetary and fiscal sense. And I think what Franklin was really trying to do here uh, in defending an inflation tax was to defend a paper fiat currency because he understood that paper money that wasn't uh, convertible to, to, to hard money, uh, rare uh, metals, uh, coins, and so on, um, that it, it could function, as he had argued many times and, and over the course of his life, in the way that any other kind of money functioned. It, it fulfilled all the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the imperatives that money carried. It was a unit of account, a medium exchange, repository of value, and so on. Um, but it would also, and most importantly, um, allow money to remain American. Only in liberating the young American Republic from dependence on a limited global supply of gold and silver coin could the work of the war for independence achieve the vital aim of liberating the United States from the great power politics of Britain and Europe. Now, in the short run, Franklin's argument would, would uh, have no traction whatsoever, um, and Hamilton uh, would prevail uh, in, in shaping the fiscal uh, practices of the United States and its, its monetary practices. And Franklin would implement, I'm sorry, uh, Hamilton would implement um, as sec uh, Treasury Secretary um, a, a, a supreme example of a, a hard money uh, currency system and banking system uh, very much designed and modeled after the banking and, and uh, public finance systems of the old world, of Britain in particular. But in the long run, I think we could say that Franklin uh, actually did uh, win the argument, although it's open to debate. Of course, modern American money is no longer convertible. Um, um, but I think just to conclude here, you, you see my, my larger point, which is that, uh, that Franklin's uh, place as a, as a figure in, in the founding pantheon, um, I think is often, uh, is, is we all recognize that and, and, and it's justly, uh, he's justly placed there in that founding pantheon. Um, but in a certain sense, if we look at Franklin's financial life, if we look at his thinking about money, um, his role in, in, in fashioning the United States, there, there are qualities of it that uh, I'm going to try to illuminate in the book that I'm writing that I think uh, are, are too often overlooked. So I'll end there and, and thank you again for your time. And, and I apologize for my uh, technical incompetence, um, but I'd be delighted if there's time to answer questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Gray. That was uh, a wonderful presentation. We do have a few, maybe two or three minutes for presentation or questions because we did start a little bit late. So I uh, don't want to deny anyone that. So if there's anyone with a quick pressing uh, question, 
Uh, I don't see any in the chat, but you're more than welcome to unmute and ask now. Uh, if not, I do actually have one question. Um, so Benjamin Franklin was a wealthy individual. Uh, he was able to, uh, you know, he was self-made essentially. Uh, he did write that pamphlet in 1729 um, uh, pro as a proponent of paper currency. Now, my question is, is that Pennsylvania paper currency is historically known for the colonial period as um, uh, the best currency that existed essentially in the, in the colonies. Um, it didn't inflate like other currencies did. Um, you know, they didn't essentially run the presses. So Pennsylvania paper currency is, you know, considered kind of the, the creme de la creme of uh, currency that circulated. Do you know if um, Pennsylvania um, lawmakers heeded to any of Franklin's advice? I mean, did he give particular economic advice in these early days, or was it more of um, as a uh, as a printer uh, standpoint? Um, so he advocated uh, paper money issues. Uh, in, in other periods, he did this during the Seven Years' War when Pennsylvania really cranked up its, its paper money uh, production, as did many other or other colonies. Um, um, you know, uh, I think there are also points where Franklin advocates redeeming paper and, and, and shrinking the paper money supply. Um, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is um, it's difficult to find another figure from the 18th century who so consistently advocates and defends paper money as a legitimate form of currency and legal tender. Um, um, you know, I, I, I don't, he doesn't write, I'm not aware of any sort of, most of what he says between 1729 and 1784 is is in the form of his kind of general wisdom about money. Um, and I would characterize that as a kind of maybe unstructured and and un, non-ideological attempt to demystify money and to 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 rid money of its negative connotations, which are kind of the other side of the sort of mystical, you know, pre-modern, alchemical associations with money, that Franklin is really trying to move money into the realm of reason and rationality um, um, and, and, and demystify it and desacralize it in a way. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of, and he's involved in the, in the arguments about money in the uh, 1750s and 60s for sure, less so, in the 60s and, and after he leaves to go to England. Um, um, but yeah, and it's true, Pennsylvania has good money, but partly because it's it backs its money with land. Um, they, they have a land bank that they use to, to back their money, but yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, that'll bring us to the end of the presentation. I think we're good. Dr. Great, uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm glad everything materialized and that we were able to, to follow through. Uh, everyone enjoy uh, this Friday afternoon and thank you again for uh, coming towards uh, our long table number 165.